One of the favorite tactics of creationists trying to undermine confidence in science is their use of mind quotations, meaning that religious apologists will sift through volumes of scientific studies, ignoring all of the evolutionary evidence therein, looking for that one line that, if taken out of context, sounds like it's saying the very opposite of what the whole study actually says. For example, some dogmatic science denialists read through the entirety of Darwin's Origin of Species and plucked out the one line that says, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. They'll show you only that quote, ignoring everything else he said immediately after that about what reads it tells me. So Darwin said, it seems absurd, but, and then he filled the next few pages with evidence supporting what only seemed absurd at first until you get to see the facts to know better. Creationist quote miners know full well that he said all that, but they don't want you to know that he said all that. They want you to think that Darwin didn't believe in his own theory, as if Darwin admitted that evolution is absurd. They know that's not what he meant, but the truth doesn't matter to religious extremists. They only care about appearances. They want to believe what they want to believe, regardless what the truth may be, and they don't want to know any better. That's why they pay apologists to lie to them, to pull the wool over their eyes and help them make believe because it's easier to maintain a delusion if it is shared by other pretenders. And then you won't even notice that it is a delusion. That way, any lie can be taken as absolute truth. So the quote miners compile all their collective nuggets together into a single web page so that their undereducated know-nothings who follow them might, if they're dumb enough, be fooled into thinking that, er, these will make, make a good argument for creationism. Without looking into the original context and without doing even a minute of study to have any idea what they're talking about. There was a debate like that recently, only a month or so ago, on creationism versus evolution, where the creationist based almost all of his presentation on mind quotations. Now, I'm going to address and correct all of that misunderstood, misrepresented misinformation, but I want to be clear that I'm not debating the person who is only sharing other people's comments. His awkward difficulty reading, especially big words, and his obvious ignorance of any part of the subject matter shows that he's not worthy of debate. Because he doesn't know anything. He's just a parrot repeating words he doesn't understand and can't pronounce. What I am addressing are the assertions made with the quotes he cited out of context and decades out of date that I have seen recited by so many other creationists over the last half century or so. This will be the first in a three-part series about the dishonest practice of creationist quote mining. Okay, doke. Here we go. Okay. So, people who believe evolution believe it's true because they believe the following 19th century myths, which have been disproved by 20th century science. That matter organizes itself into considerable levels of complexity by chemical determination, which contradicts the laws of physics and observed chemistry. That genetic mutations incrementally build new structural designs or modifying extant designs with new biomechanical functions. This contradicts 90 years of genetic experimentation. Or that similarities in the structural designs of various kinds of life is evidence that they are related by common ancestry, which ignores countless incongruencies. Creationists don't have these problems. Only evolutionists have them. Evolutionists, meaning people who accept evident reality, don't have these problems because things are obviously not how this rando wants them to seem. These are not myths like creationism is. None of them were disproved by modern science like creationism was, and they don't break any natural laws like creationism does. The problem creationists have is that we're not the ones ignoring decades of contradictory evidence. Science has working models that are tried and true based on demonstrable fact with profound explanative and predictive power that are always borne out and made stronger by further discoveries without any contradiction. Whereas all creationists have is an inability to even participate, backed only by an obstinate denial of reality, preferring to make believe in magic instead. When presented with the evidence that these myths are false and that the evidence of creation is true, anyone who investigates afterward the validity of the evidence will become convinced that evolution is false and creation is true. Well, there are a couple problems with that. One is that these are not myths. They're not false. 
Another problem is that there was never any evidence that creationism is true, and we actually have proof that it isn't. And finally, anyone who honestly investigates the validity of the evidence will accept evolution as fact and creationism as fantasy. After investigation has verified this to them, anyone who denies that creation is true or continues to argue that evolution is true is a denialist of science because they have a paradigm that they're unwilling to give up because the alternative is unacceptable to them. These are simply facts. No, this is simply the first foundational falsehood of creationism. The false dichotomy that one must either reject all concepts of divinity if they're going to accept evolution, or they must reject evolution if they're going to believe in God. Because they think that you have to treat the Bible or the Quran or whatever other supposedly sacred scripture of man-made mythology they imagine to be God's word, as if it were the ultimate infallible authority. In a sense, Christian creationists are bibliologists worshipping the Bible as God. They can't distinguish doctrine from deity because they think that if you disprove the Bible, you disprove God right along with it, as if God cannot exist unless the Bible is absolutely accurate on all accounts. Obviously, not everyone suffers from such binary thinking. Creationism is a form of religious extremism, typically biblical literalism, which denies evolution in whole or in part and rejects scientific methodology as well. Creationists are a particular phenomenon in the United States where they, they are just a lunatic fringe in other first world nations. Statistically, most evolutionists around the world have been Christian and most Christians are evolutionists. Even in the US where at least a third of US scientists are Christian, nearly all of those scientists believe in God and accept evolution at the same time. That goes for all these evolutionary scientists who are also Christian. They see no conflict between religious faith and scientific knowledge. Many of the pioneers and champions of evolutionary theory have been and are Christians. Take, for example, Dr. Kenneth Miller. He's a Christian. He believes in God, and he is also one of the most famous evolutionary biologists working today. He debated all the intelligent design creations from the pseudoscience propaganda mill known as the Discovery Institute, and he disproved every one of their arguments for irreducible complexity, both scientifically and in a court of law, where he was the star witness defending evolution in the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, which found the intelligent design movement to be a criminal conspiracy to get around the laws against teaching religion instead of science. Dr. Miller has what he describes to be traditional Christian beliefs, but he's not a creationist. Instead, he said, Presumably there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a theist. In, in the broadest sense, I would say I believe in a designer, but you know what? I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us. So God is not the unacceptable alternative that the science-denying fundamentalists want to make it out to be. The reality is that whether you believe in a God or not, or whether there is a God or not, evolution is still a demonstrable and inescapable reality either way. One million studies or more have been conducted in genetic mutation. It's been dem demonstrated consistently for 90 years. The mutation is no such thing as a mechanism for evolution. That's a 19th century, uh, early 20th century myth. Mutations do not build structural designs in living things. If they do not, evolution cannot be true because mutation and natural selection can't have built all the functional structural designs of all the various living things in the world. And 90 years of experimentation in genetics has disproved the myth that mutation is a designer of structural design. In 1783, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier disproved phlogiston theory and proposed in its stead his own theory of oxygen. In 1828, Frederick Wohler disproved the theory of vitalism with his synthesis of urea. In the 1880s, German biologist August Weissmann disproved Lamarckism by formulating the germ plasm theory of inheritance. You can't put a date on when genetics disproved mutation as a mechanism of evolution because that never happened. Here again, the quote miner reveals that he has no idea what he's talking about. He's only read creationist websites, so he's only heard one side of the story, and he doesn't understand it, and all of that was lies anyway. If you want to get both sides of the story, or at least the right side, 
if, if you don't have much time or formal education and you want to do the barest amount of research to get the proper understanding of evolution the quickest way you can, I suggest you look at Berkeley University's Introductory Primer Evolution 101. Herein it explains in a few different places how mutations are a mechanism of evolutionary change. That's a .edu site, so you can bet that modern college biology texts say the same thing, which, of course, they do. I'll include a link below to a .gov national health site that also explains how mutations are known to be mechanisms of evolution, because that was effectively proved, not disproved. Um, for example, as far back as 1983 and long before, Scientists have stated, it is striking that, but not much mentioned fact, though geneticists have been breeding fruit flies for 60 years or more in labs around the world. Now, this was published in 1983. 60 years in labs around the world. Flies which produce new generations every 11, 11 days, they have yet to see the emergence of a new species or even a new enzyme. So even by 1983, 60 years of mutation experimentation have been performed. And the mutations are consistent. The evidence is clear. They don't design anything. They destroy. Again, the evidence isn't what the quote miner thinks it is. This quote isn't what he wants to think it is either. It's not from an evolutionary scientist. At least he wasn't Darwinian. Gordon Rattray Taylor was still advocating Lamarckism a hundred years after it had been disproved. His book, The Great Evolution Mystery, was panned by new scientists soon after publication. Another reviewer described it as one long, repetitive argument from personal incredulity, full of factual errors, because every page revealed how the author did not understand how evolution really works. More importantly, though, I asked the famous biologist Jerry Coyne about this, since he's done a lot of this type of research on fruit flies. He says that while it is true that new species of fruit flies haven't appeared in the lab spontaneously, he gave this list of experiments on reproductive isolation between populations, all beginning a couple years after the quote from Gordon Taylor. Beyond that, I found a number of other, even more recent articles documenting the next step, resulting in controlled speciation, new phenotypic species of fruit flies being produced in the lab. These two occurred after Gordon Taylor's quote. Back then, it was thought to take at least 100,000 years to produce new species of fruit fly. Now we know it can happen much faster than that, though still usually not within a single lifetime. But artificial selection is much, much faster than natural selection. And of course, there are also other studies confirming speciation of fruit flies under naturally controlled conditions in the field, too, uh, just over the last few thousand years. Uh, Jonathan Wells, multiple PhDs, California Berkeley University, says, but there is no evidence that DNA mutations can provide the sort of vari variation needed for evolution. There is no evidence that for beneficial mutations at the level of macroevolution. But there is no evidence for the level of common uh, regarded as uh, micro, but there is evidence for microevolution. This quote is misleading too, because Jonathan Wells is not an evolutionary biologist. He's an intelligent design creationist and a Mooney. Many years ago, his spiritual leader, Reverend Sung Myung Moon, famously financed Wells' doctoral education. And back then, Moon explained that God wanted Wells to earn a biology degree, specifically so that Wells could destroy Darwinism from within. So Jonathan Wells was already a religious cultist who was all about preserving his preconceived biases, defending the faith, and he is not open to understanding the actual science that he was always determined to undermine. And also Theodorus Dobhansky, the famous geneticist, said, most mutants uh, which arise in any organism are less uh, are more or less disadvantageous to their processors. Possessors. The classic mutants are attained uh, by mutating uh, flies, he says. They break down organs, they cause the disappearance of them. Mutants uh, have uh, changes in pigments, uh, you know, legs where eyes are supposed to be, and some are uh, fatal. While this is true, it's important to note that Theodosius Dobzhansky was both a Christian and a pioneer of evolutionary genetics, and he was the first one to document evolution of a new species in the lab. He continued his research until 20 years after this quote, when he wrote his most famous paper with the title, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in Light of Evolution. And so this is all we observe when it comes to mutation. It is 
simply true. Verified by 90 years of experimentation, mutation is not a mechanism for evolution as evolutionists claim. Therefore, evolution is false. It's been known for a long time. It's been known for 90 years, but evolutionists are in denial of 90 years of scientific evidence. Let me correct that lie by referring to another scientific expert who is a Christian and accepts the supposedly unacceptable alternative while defending education and evolution. And once again, I'm talking about the professor of cell biology who literally wrote the book, or rather a series of academic textbooks on the evidence of evolution in the genome, Dr. Kenneth Miller. It'd be hard to come up with a more inaccurate statement uh, than that one about the past 90 years of research in genetics and evolution and molecular biology. Uh, in fact, what has happened is the more that we study and the more precise our tools get in terms of investigating the genome, the mechanism of evolutionary change, the more, it's, the more it becomes apparent that mutation sort of broadly construed is indeed the mechanism that produces the genomic change upon which natural selection can act. And I can list example after example of beneficial and constructive mutations that basically have improved the survival capability of all sorts of organisms. And I can give you a couple. Um, the waters of Antarctica um, are actually below the freezing point. Now, they don't always freeze solid because, as you might know, there's an awful lot of salt in the ocean, which depresses the freezing point. But the bloodstream of fish living in the Antarctic Ocean would actually freeze solid unless they had proteins in their bloodstream which depressed the freezing point. In other words, antifreeze proteins. Well, in the last 15 years, it's become possible to do molecular biology and genomic analysis on their own genetic systems. And what we discover is there's a variety of antifreeze proteins that these fish, many of whom are unrelated phylogenetically, possess. And what do these antifreeze proteins turn out to be? Well, in many cases, they turn out to be uh, proteins that are produced by genes that were actually there for other purposes originally, then were duplicated, and then underwent mutations that did two things. One, mistargeted, mistargeted them into the bloodstream in the case of a digestive enzyme, and altered their amino acid sequence to make them more effective in depressing the freezing point. And these mutations have enabled these fish to thrive as the Antarctic Ocean got colder and colder. And we can see that, and we can see that very clearly. And I'll give you another example. Uh, a, 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 a nylon is a human invention. And in the 1920s and 1930s, it was first produced synthetically. Uh, and then not surprisingly, nylon debris and waste enter the environment. Well, almost three decades ago, a group of Japanese scientists noticed that something seemed to be growing on the surfaces of ponds that basically were processing wastewater from the synthesis of nylon. And what they discovered were bacteria that had evolved a new enzyme called nylon ACE, which is actually able to break nylon down. Now, the mutations that would have produced this obviously were beneficial to those bacteria because they enabled them to grow on a new food source. About a decade later, another group of Japanese scientists decided to see if they could actually watch the evolution of a nylon ACE enzyme. And they uh, cultured unrelated bacteria in the laboratory. They provided them with a fair amount of nylon polymer and monomer as a food source. And lo and behold, within a very short number of generations, they too evolved the ability to produce a protein that enabled them to thrive on nylon as an energy source. And these are just two examples. And I could go on for a very long time showing that, in fact, there are beneficial mutations. And these beneficial mutations are, in fact, the basis of evolutionary change, short term and long term. Genetic information is overlapping and nested. It's highly compressed. A single string of information in the DNA could code for numerous different proteins. Sequences are trapped within each other and they overlap each other. The information is highly compressed. Base pairs share the same, uh, different sequences of information share the same base pairs. So what happens when you insert, have an insertion mutation? You break the DNA to stick in a new gene and guess what happens? 
you just damage several genes. That's what insertion mutations do. Here's a reference that deletion and mutation and insertion duplication genetic mutations are one of the single greatest causes of disorders. They're not a mechanism for designing anything. That's an extraordinary statement to respond to. Um, the idea that genetic information can be nested in the sense that you could have the same se sequence of DNA. And occasionally, you could have examples where you have overlapping transcriptional patterns so that you do indeed produce more than one messenger RNA and more than one protein product out of it. That's absolutely true. But when you actually examine the human genome, in other words, when you sit down at the computer, and you look at the A's, T's, G's, and C's, and you look for open reading frames, which are the sequences that could conceivably be transcribed to produce messenger RNA to produce protein, you discover something that sort of puts the lie to what you just heard, which is that functional genes, open reading frames, are few and far between. Most of the genome, in a sense, is empty space. Uh, and the notion that the individual transcriptional frames are so internested that an insertion is going to destroy information. Um, that's simply not true. And we have many examples of insertion and deletion mutations that really do affect just one particular protein product. Now, sometimes those effects are pleiotropic, meaning that they change more than one characteristic of an organism. But the very idea that an insertion mutation is inevitably destructive and is inevitably fatal, um, in fact, is absolutely false. Uh, and I can give one example after another uh, in the literature in which an insertion mutation, for example, has taken a duplicate gene, put a new, uh, a new promoter uh, a sequence in front of it. That's the region where RNA polymerase binds to activate a gene and then produced a brand new functional protein with a slightly different function. So the notion that genetic information is wound together so tight that a, an individual base pair mutation or insertion would be fatal to hordes of genetic information. That's simply not borne out by reality. Lynn Margillis, the famous evolutionist author, said, I have seen no evidence whatsoever that these evolutionary changes through the accumulation of gradual mutations. This out of context quote makes it sound like she's saying that she's never seen any evidence of evolution at all. That's not the case. As she said there's no doubt that it exists. But notice that she says these changes. And so she wasn't talking about evolution in general. She was talking about particular changes, specifically how a form of rickettsia bacteria came to live inside of eukaryotic cells, becoming mitochondria. That change doesn't occur from accumulated mutations, but rather from an entirely different evolutionary mechanism, which she identified as endosymbiosis. Well, I have the privilege of knowing Lynn Margulis, who's an extraordinary scientist. And one of the points that she liked to make about evolution was that all too many evolutionary biologists had emphasized competition, ruthless competition, as the driver for evolutionary change. Now, there's no question that competition between individuals in the same species and between individuals in different species does drive evolution but it's not the sole force. And one of the things that Margulis really contributed to our understanding of evolution was the importance of cooperation and cooperation between individuals, uh, between different species, and the way in which basically horizontal uh, gene transfer uh, enables uh, organisms to acquire new characteristics. Now she's most remembered for what is now termed the endosymbiotic hypothesis. And that is the two of the most important parts of the cell, two of the most important organelles uh, in cells with nuclei like ours, eukaryotic cells, are mitochondria, which are often called the powerhouses of the cell, and chloroplasts in green plants that capture sunlight and change it into chemical energy. And for that matter, take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen. Both of those organelles, curiously, have their own little DNA molecules within them. They're circular, they're small, they contain a number of genes, dwarfed by the number of genes in the nucleus, but it turns out the genes they do contain are essential to their function. Now, where do they come from, and how do these little packages of DNA get there? 
her idea, which was revolutionary at the time she first advanced it, was that these DNA molecules are there because both mitochondria and chloroplasts are the remnants of free living prokaryotic bacteria like uh, organisms that somehow took up residence inside an early eukaryotic cell and conferred benefits upon the cell and the cell conferred benefits upon that early prokaryote. And eventually this endosymbiotic relationship evolved to the point of cooperation that was so profound that it gave new capabilities to eukaryotic cells, including plants and animals that they could no longer live without. So again, this was not an example of ruthless competition between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. This was an example of a fruitful collaboration that became a necessary element of the living world today. And that was not a contradiction of evolution. That was an enhancement of our understanding of the way evolution works. And that's exactly how Margulis described it. Uh, as an aside, uh, you knew her after her divorce with Sagan. Oh, right? yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the, um, I, I, my, I've, I met her twice uh, for, for when I was invited to give lectures at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, most recently, uh, unfortunately, just about five or six months before her death, um, and I had lunch with her, and it was uh, just a wonderful discussion. She's an extraordinary person. Okay. And, 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 and incidentally, the, you know, this, I don't, uh, I don't know how well this will go in your podcast. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. I went to a public high school, a town called Rawway, Rawway High School. Uh, so did uh, my mom's family uh, and my mom's sister, my aunt. And at one point when I was visiting family back in New Jersey, I mentioned Carl Sagan. And I knew that Carl Sagan had also gone to the same high school. And to my astonishment, my aunt uh, piped up, said, oh, yeah, uh, Carl Sagan took me to the senior prom. And it was just like, you're kidding. Um and as if to prove that, she pulled out her high school yearbook, and there was really a, quite a touching tribute to the wonderful date that he and Doris had had at the senior prom. Unfortunately, I never met uh, never met Carl Sagan. Okay. As I said, that was just an aside, just out of curiosity. Yeah. If you had said that you'd met Carl Sagan, I would have just been envious again. All right. <laughs> In this episode, we've established that mutations really are a mechanism of evolution because they really do generate new genetic information with beneficial effects. In the next episode of the series, we'll talk about some more mind quotations in paleontology.